بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسنى أولئك عنها مبعدون لا يسمعون حسيسها وهم في مشتهت أنفسهم وهم في ما اشتهت أنفسهم خالدون لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر وتتلقى قاهم الملائكة هذا يومكم الذي كنتم توعدون يوم نطوي السماء كطي السجل للكتب كما بدأنا أول خلق وعدا علينا إنا كنا فاعلين ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يرثها عبادي الصالحون إن في هذا لبلاغا لقوم عابدين وما سلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum. On behalf of the Maldives National Youth Council, I welcome Brother Ahmad Didat and Brother Abdullah Didat and all of you brothers and sisters to this meeting this evening. We are very privileged today to have Brother Ahmad Didat with us here in Mali. Alhamdulillah. He, Brother Didat, is the president of Islamic Propagation Center in Durban, South Africa. Today, he will be speaking to us on the topic, missionary inroads. Brother Didat has kindly consented to talk for 45 minutes, after which will be question time until 5.45. Brothers and sisters, 
you're welcome to write down your questions and forward it to the bench. And we will ask the question of, from Brother Dida, depending on the time we have. So, without wasting much time, may I present to you Brother Dida. Mr. Chairman, and my dear brothers and sisters, and my little children, it gives me great pleasure I'm very, very happy indeed to be here on your island and to meet my brother in here, which I didn't imagine existed, the Maldive Islands, you know, a very small group of islands, sometimes on the map of the world, we don't even see them. But I find that it is a reality. Muslims and good Muslims at that, I am very, very happy to be associated with you all. And while I'm here, actually I came here to this conference, I wanted to have a closer contact with the people. And I'm very, very grateful to my brethren for giving me this opportunity of coming to you and speaking to you. More especially this afternoon on the subject of missionary inroads. Now, this conflict between Islam and the previous two Semitic religions, the Jews and the Christians, has been with Islam from its earliest beginnings. As soon as our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the Hijrah, the migration from Makkah to Medina, he was forced to, by circumstances, the Mushriks of Makkah had made life untenable for him, and he had to make the Hijrah. In Medina, he was surrounded by Jews and Christians. See, in Makkah, it was all mushriks, 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 idol worshippers, pagans. But in Medina and around Medina, there was a more sophisticated community, people who had previous religious scriptures, the Jews and the Christians. And when the people of Medina began accepting Islam, accepting our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the messenger of Allah, they began taunting the Muslims. He says, you are following this Ummi, a person who is unlettered, who doesn't know how to read or write. You know, he's going to mislead you. He's going to misguide you. If you want to go to heaven, if you want salvation, Rahe Najat, Jannah. So, either you become a Jew, said the Jews, or you become a Christian, said the Christians. And Allah records that for us in His eternal book, the Holy Quran. I read a very brief verse from the Holy Quran, from Surah Baqarah, Surah Baqarah, Verse number 111, 111, where Allah says, That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslims. Allah is telling us. This is what He says that the Jews and the Christians will never, never learn. I have come across many brethren here who know Arabic. See, on a percentage basis, more Muslims here, they know Arabic than my people in South Africa. Very few, a handful of us know Arabic. We read the Quran, all of us, they read the Quran, but very few can speak Arabic. You seem to have been in touch with Al-Azhar, and you have graduates from Al-Azhar coming along and living in your midst, your own people. We are not that fortunate in South Africa. 
We have a very sophisticated community, but very few know Arabic as a language. You are very fortunate. Those of you who know Arabic, you will be able to verify that lan, lan means never, never, most certainly not. وَلَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you unless you follow the brand of religion. And this is an eternal truth with us. Wherever we are, we find the same situation. No man, how much backward we bend trying to appease the people. They will not be satisfied with you unless they swallow you, unless they make you a Christian. The Portuguese, I understand, were here on your islands. Very nice people, gentle people, obedient people, easily enslaved. Nice, kind people, kind hearted, very sweet. Your people. So they came here and they made a home. And they find that the people are amenable. You can do what you like with them. So I'm given to understand that they had a brainwave, the Pope, his holiness of the time, the Pope in Rome, he made a pronouncement, sent a decree, convert these people, baptize them all. Dip them in, in the water and take them out as Christian. The Muslims, put him in as Muslim and take him out as Christian. Baptize them all. And one of your heroes, he realized what was happening, that the whole nation was going to go to the dogs. Whole nation. So he revolted and he succeeded in oosting the Portuguese. So you are Muslims today, alhamdulillah, had it not been in the 15th century or so, all would you have been dipped in the water and taken out as Christians and all today you are eating pieces of bread in what is called the Holy Communion. He said, this is the flesh of Jesus. You'd be drinking wine and said, this is the blood of Jesus. That would have been your pastime every Sunday morning, eating the flesh of Jesus and drinking the blood of Jesus. Alhamdulillah, you are safe from that. You can never thank Allah enough for that. So, they, are, they want to convert you. They're not just satisfied you are slaving for them. You can do their work at, the, at their bidding, at their double. They are not satisfied. They must have you converted. And this is an experience, an eternal experience the Muslims are having all over the world. We Muslims, we are telling the Christians in my country that we Muslims, we believe in Jesus. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. We say Isa alayhi salam. Isa, Jesus, may peace be upon him. That we believe in him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, a miracle of Allah's creation. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. And we believe that Allah saved, that he gave life to the dead and Allah saved him from an ignoble death on the cross. Does that satisfy the Christians? No. It doesn't satisfy them. Closest to the Christian. We are also closest to the Jew. Amazing, amazing situation. That oil and water. We are claiming affinity, relationship with both. And it's, it's the truth. There are no Jews here that I'm trying to flatter you, or no Christians, I take it, that I'm trying to flatter you. I'm not trying to flatter anybody. This is a true position. We are the closest to the Jew, the Yahudi, in our concept of the divinity of God Almighty. The Jew says that God Almighty is absolutely one. We say we believe that he is one. They say he is Echad, we say he is Ahad. Same. It's the same word meaning the same thing. It's a linguistic difference. Ahad, Echad. Same. They say God is unique, we say God is unique. We say God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live and we agree with him. He says we must not eat the flesh of swine. We say we will not eat the flesh of swine. He says no eating of blood. We say we won't eat blood. He says circumcision. We say we are all circumcised. 
The Maldivians, do they circumcise? They do? Yes. We are agreed. In the Muslim world, we are going together. Does that satisfy them? No. No. That doesn't satisfy. The Christians, when we say we believe in Jesus, He is the Masih, the Masihullah, nothing satisfies them. They want you to be baptized, put you in the water and take you out, put you in as Muslim and take you out as Christian. Transformation. Now, my, oh, the, the, the sad experience of my people, see, I come I, from India originally. I come originally from India, from the west coast of India. You know Bombay? You see it on the map. Bombay, a little above Bombay is a small port called Surat. I come from that area. I migrated to South Africa in 1927. Most of you were not born then. I migrated there then. And most of my life I spent there. But I originate on the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. Now, the sad experience that my people had was that when the British conquered India, they realized that at any time anybody will give them trouble, it will be the Muslims. Because power, rule, dominion was wrenched out of their hands. And once you have tasted power, you yearn for it once more. You want to have it again. You tasted it, power, it's very sweet, very pleasant. You remember it over and over again. You want it. So, and the Muslims were a militant people compared to the Hindus of the time. They were then, in India, they were as docile as the cows that they were worshipping. I understand you have no cows here. You have no cows. But you know what a cow looks like. You people do know. Yes. It was amazing. <laughs> you have no cows in the country. My people are worshipping the cow in India. <laughs> you haven't got them. So they were docile. You know, the cow is a very docile animal. Docile, you know, very <laughs> like the good Maldivians, you know, very nice, kind hearted. It's not a very good quality. I assure you, it's a very good quality. But it's a contradiction. I say, you are very good people, but when you are so sweet, people have a tendency to chew you up. You know that? He says, human, human failing. When we find people are very nice, we take advantage of the good nature. So, my father used to tell me, he says, my son, don't be so sweet that people chew you up. <laughs> and don't be so bitter that they spit you out. <laughs> I think I've tried to heed that warning. You know? Don't be too sweet and don't be so bitter. You people are very sweet. <laughs> yes, there's a danger there. There's a danger there. However, you see, the Christians, the British, they felt that if we can change the Muslims, if we can convert them, if we can teach them to turn the other cheek, because Jesus Christ is supposed to have said, in the Christian Bible, that he who strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. Now, if we can make the Muslims to do that, we can rule them for a thousand years. So they started pouring in the missionaries, preachers, priests, into India like frogs in the rainy season. I see you have a rainy season here, but I haven't seen any frogs. Do you have frogs here? Frogs? You have frogs. I don't know, I'm talking to people, they, they have no cows, I don't know whether you have frogs on this island or not. I understand you have no dogs either. No dogs? No dogs, no pigs? Wonderful country. <laughs> so I have to start telling you everything, what a dog is like, and what a dog does, and how it behaves, and the pig what it does. <laughs> but I'm sure you learn all this at school, you know. I won't waste my time with you. So they started pouring in the missionaries like frogs in my country, in India. In rainy season, the frogs come out by the thousands. You see, therefore I said frogs in the rainy season. You have a continuous rainy season, so the frogs don't come out. <laughs> and these missionaries, you see, they started challenging the Muslims to public debates. Thinking, by getting our alim on the platform, debating with him and making a fool out of him in front of the people, that everybody will get converted. This was the psychology. 
So they started challenging the Muslims to public debates. At first, the Muslims were reluctant, naturally. These people had just conquered us. And if some of our alim speak a bit too militantly, like people have a tendency to say, Mr. Didat speak too militantly. He's too militant. Even nice, kind, soft people to talk, you know. Nice, nice. Sweetie, sweetie, goody, goody. <laughs> I don't know. Allah has made me what I am. You know, if the mic systems fail, I can still talk to you all at the back. This is something Allah has given me. My voice, my height, everything He's given it to me. I didn't acquire it. He gave it to me. And I'm using it. And it's paying dividends. It gives me good returns. But now some of our brethren who are a bit more timid, they say, ah, he speaks too loud. He gets hot under the collar. He's too militant. You know, he must speak softly, kindly. So the people were afraid. Going and debating with the Christian, the ruler, her people, and getting into some political difficulty. They might send you to the Andaman Islands then. I don't know if they knew about Maldives, you know. That was close, the Andaman Islands, they call them Kalapani, black waters. So he says, no, 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 rather keep out of harm's way. Silence is golden. So, and we didn't know the language. We couldn't speak English, our people, our learned men, they only knew Urdu, Farsi, and the native language. They didn't know the language of the rulers. So the missionaries, they mastered our language. And this is the genius of the Westerner. You know, if you allow him to make inroads into your country, in three months' time, they'll learn your language. And they'll talk to you in your language. They'll present to you the Bible in your language. Not in English or Arabic, that they have, plenty. But in your own native tongue, and in your own script. You know the script that you are writing? I can't read. That script, they'll give it to you. And you lap it up. You can't help it, it's human nature. Your tongue, mother tongue, there's nothing sweeter to a man than his own mother tongue. There's no better way to get into the heart of a person than through his own mother tongue. If I could speak your language, wallah, I would have spoken it to you. <laughs> so they started mastering our language, Urdu. And now they started challenging the Muslims to debates in Urdu, the language of the elite in India, the alims, the learned men, what to do. So the younger generation persuaded a Maulana Abdul Aziz of Delhi. They call him Maulana Abdul Aziz Dehlavi, means of Delhi. He says, look, Maulana Sahib, he's a respected learned man, Maulana. I wonder if you understand, you know, I'm a sheikh, respected sheikh. They want to debate with us in our own mother tongue. How can we say no? So the poor man was forced to agree. And a certain reverend founder, who was the head of this Christian missionary movement, he and the Maulana had a debate. And a hundred thousand people gathered. I don't know how voice was carried those days. There was no mic system. That you know, no loudspeakers. But people, man, they had that fun of it. From a distance, they can see what's going on. They're like tiny little pins, you know. They're standing there on a platform, and they're saying something. What did he say? What did he say? And everybody passed on something, whatever he imagines. <laughs> the Maulana gave one arpa cut. <laughs> well, this is how they got vicarious pleasures, you see. So, according to the appointed time and date, the debate starts. Now. This I was reading in a book called Izharul Haq, and that book changed my life. That made me to come here today. You see, I'm reading all this in a book. That the debate starts with the Reverend Founder suggesting to the Maulana, he said, Maulana Sahib, get started. Shuru kijiye, shuru kijiye. So the Maulana says, You see, you Christians, you are our elder brother. Because Christianity preceded Islam by 600 years. Christianity is 600 years older than Islam. As such, you are our elder brother. And according to our culture, our human behavior, our elder brother has the first preference. Number two, you are our guest. No doubt an unwelcome guest, but a guest at that. As such, also, according to our culture, you have the first preference. 
So the reverend was forced to start the debate and he started with a question. He said, Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana, Shah, Imam, where is your Prophet Muhammad now? Now, 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 this minute, where is he? So the Maulana thought for a moment and he said that he is in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of that answer came the second question. It was all prepared, worked out, planned, strategy. Said, all right, all right, now tell us, Maulana Sahib, respected Maulana, where was your prophet Muhammad when his grandson Hussein was martyred at Karbala, made shaheed at Karbala, where was he then? So the Maulana again thought for a moment and he said that he was still in Jannatul Firdaus, heavenly bliss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of that answer came the third question. He said, all right, all right, tell us, Maulana Sahib, that if your prophet Muhammad was with his Allah in Jannah, in heaven, when his grandson Hussein was being martyred, butchered at Karbala, didn't he ask his Allah for help? Naturally. If somebody is, take, is taking unfair advantage over me, I'm an old man of 70 years, I can ask my younger brother and say, look man, this fellow is taking advantage, man, please, you know, come to the rescue, won't I? It's natural. So if you have God Almighty there by your side, and somebody is butchering your grandson, naturally you'll ask for help. Say, so didn't he ask his Allah for help? And there was a long pause. He says, come on, come on, come on, come on. So the Maulana said, yes, yes, he did. He did ask Allah for help. Then said, so what did he say? What did Allah say? Because we know he wasn't saved. What did he say? And there was an inordinate pause, over long pause. So the reverend started beating his feet again. Come on, come on, means, what did Allah say? So the Maulana began slowly, that Allah cried, you know, Allah cried. So what? Allah cried? He said, yes, Allah cried. He said, I couldn't save my own son, Jesus. How can I save your grandson? <laughs> and it was over. You see? You and I hope. You see, that's what the Christian says. That Jesus Christ on the cross, he cried, Oh my Father, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabahtani. He says, Oh my Father, Oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God let him down, according to the Bible. So he said, If I can't save my own son from the Jews, the most despicable community, they killed my son and I couldn't do anything. How can I save your grandson? Utterly helpless. Debate was over. It was a matching of the wits. It had nothing to do with truth or falsehood. So this is just, it's a matching of your wits, cleverness. Who gets in first? As the saying goes, twice armed is he whose cause is just. But thrice armed is he who gets in first. Like the Jews, every time. You see, the Muslim is talking, hey, we'll do this and we'll do that. He gives it to you, what they call preemptive strike. 48, they knocked out our brothers. 56, they knocked them out. 67, they knocked them out. You know that? Because this guy's talking, oh, you'll do this and you'll do that. Your cause is right. But the other guy gets it first. He gives it to you. He gives it to you. He knocks you out. So this was a matching of wits. Who gets in first? Knockout blow. The debate was over. This type of conflict. And the Christian missionaries, in trying to make the inroads into Muslim hearts and minds, into Muslim territories. I'll give you another example of an Arab sheikh. An Arab sheikh. You see, you people have been very fortunate, or unfortunate. You never had these experiences, unfortunate. Fortunate that you have been saved from this fire. So far, so far. No longer, you know, seas are no longer barriers. Ideas, they don't need ships to cross the oceans anymore. You know that? They don't need ships. They come airwaves, minds of men. You send your son children for further education, and there the brainwashing takes place. You know, it's an eternal battle. It can't be helped. 
You can't live in isolation. You can't say now we are immune from any type of dangers. There's no such thing. Ideas, they creep in. Your own children will bring them in. You send them to Russia for education, free education. When they come back, your own, they'll be reeking with communism. This is human nature. You get pickled wherever you go. Alhamdulillah, you send them to Al-Azhar, they came back with Arabic. You send them to Russia, they come back with communism. This is natural, natural. So this Arab sheikh, he was confronted by a missionary, and he, he keeps on coming every day, preaching Christ crucified, Christ died for your sins. You see, this is the only sales point that the Christian has. In my country, I'm boasting. In my country, I boast for my community. I said, we Muslims, we are the most hospitable people in the country. We are the most ethical, moral people in the country. We have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. And we have the highest charity rate in the country. There is not another nation in my country who can show a candle to us to tell us that we are better than you. So what is there? What can you teach me? I'm telling you, what can you teach me? Nothing! He can teach us nothing, Allah, nothing. The only thing he can tell me is that Christ died for your sins. He <laughs> says, so all these good works of yours, he says, are like filthy rags. You know rags? Rags. Cheater. You know these rags you, you wipe things with. Rags. All your good deeds, he's quoting from the Bible, are like filthy rags. So salvation, Rahe Najat, Jannah, only comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus. You believe that Christ died for your sin, salvation is yours. No man, what a rotter you are, a rapist and a murderer you are, you will go to heaven. The Muslim, <laughs> he straight jackets his life. He's the most ethical, charitable people, hospitable people, they'll all go to hell. This is his philosophy. This is what he believes. So the only thing he can tell us is that Christ died for your sins. Otherwise, he can teach you nothing. So this missionary got stuck into this Arab Shaykh. Christ died for your sins. Ya Shaykh, you're wasting your time praying five times a day. Up and down, up and down. You're killing yourself. Ya Shaykh, you're killing yourself fasting one whole month, winter or summer. He's got hungry for that, for your fast. So he says, no. I said, you see, you're wasting your time. You're straight jacking to your, jacketing your life. He said, you can't eat this and you can't eat that. And hmm, all. What is all this? Is God hungry for that? Making life miserable for the poor sheikh. No peace. No peace. What to do? And these missionaries are persevering. They have patience and perseverance, which we lack. We haven't got it. We get impatient very quickly. I don't know about them, how the Maldivians, you know, how the character, I don't know, I haven't tested you out yet. But generally, you know, the Christian missionary, if you give him your finger, he'll never let you go until you are converted. Or you tell him one day, say, hey, I don't want to see your, I don't want you to darken my door again, otherwise I'll put a knife through you. Maybe that might keep him away. Otherwise, he'll never let you go. You give him a finger, he'll catch you by the hand and he'll keep you there. So this poor Arab Shah, he doesn't know what to do. Life is miserable. Hmm. So he thinks of a plan, and he tells his minister, he said, look, next time this guy comes along, please, come and whisper something in my ears. Plan is laid. Next morning, the guy, salam alaikum. And the Muslim, the Arab especially, he said, ahlan wa sahlan. You know, these are the most beautiful words of welcome in any language. Ahlan wa sahlan, ahlan. Just think that you are a member of the family and sahal be at ease. Like in the army, there's a standard ease. Now you can pick your nose, you can do what you like. <laughs> when you are at attention, 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 even the flies buzzing around you, you mustn't shake your head. But when it's a standard ease, now you can do what you like. So it's like that, ahlan wa sahlan. Look, just think you are a member of the family, you don't have to put up any A's, you know how you behave, you are one of us. Ahlan wa sahlan. Beautiful. 
and he just can't help it. That's his nature. Ahlan was Ahlan. Although in his heart he resents, he wants to stab the fellow, knife him. But Ahlan was Ahlan, the Arab. Very good. Very good for that. You see, I'm not jealous. We must try and beat one another in good works. I do produce beautiful books. All this picture of the masjid, over a quarter million we have given out. One of the largest masjids in the southern hemisphere. Like your masjid here, which you can also do with the principles of Islam on the reverse. When people visit the mosque, I give them this as a memento, and with that goes the principles of Islam. If you give them principles of Islam, as soon as it goes out, it squashes and throws it away. I say, no, no, give him something nice to keep. So, beautiful. You agree? Beautiful. Look at this. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, free. Is the Bible God's word? Free. Look at this production. Crucifixion or crucifixion? Free. A hundred thousand at a time? Free. All this. Christ in Islam? Free. What the Bible? Beautiful productions. But I said, the Pakistanis beat me. Look at this. They're giving this to people free in Pakistan. And I wanted to kiss it. Allah's name, Muhammad's name, I wanted to kiss it. But the people give me no chance, so I put it in my pocket. And I didn't have a chance in Karachi. Next day I was going to Dubai. And in Dubai, in my hotel, sitting on the bed, I said, let me clear my pockets. I take it out. I read it. Allah Muhammad. Something else. I can't read this. I see here. Beautiful. Sticker. It says, Abana. I said, maybe it's Rabbana. Atina. Fit dunya. Hasanatam. I'm thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I turn them upside down. I look at the back. A calendar. Whole year's calendar. Mm -hmm. Something there. Something there. He says, here, yeah, the Lord's Prayer. I said, the Lord's Prayer? I said, we don't talk like that, do we? We say, Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We don't say the Lord's Prayer, do we? So I look up again. This is not Rabbana Atina Fid Dunya Hasanatam. This is Abbana. So, oh, the Christian prayer. Say, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Shh. Beautiful Islamic calligraphy. They know how to catch fish. Our children, they pick it up, they'll tear it out and put it in the Quran. This, and the mother will be happy. Because the father is, oh, mashallah. Who gave you my child? So some chacha, some uncle, old uncle gave you. Mashallah, beautiful. <coughs> this one, everybody says, Allah Muhammad. I know you are a bit far. If you are closer, you would also agree. Allah Muhammad. But this is not Allah Muhammad, it's Allah Muhabbah. Look at this. The, the calligraphy is exactly as we write Allah Muhammad. They wrote Allah Muhabbah. But you are reading Allah Muhammad. Everybody is making the mistake. Allah Muhammad. I give you an old sheikh. An Arab sheikh in Jeddah. Sheikh Ahmad uh, Ali Rida. An elderly man like me. I show him this. I said, you see, yeah, sheikh, they gave me this in Karachi. Says Allah Muhammad. I said, no, no, no. Have a good look. So he looks again and says, Allah Muhammad, as, Ya Shaykh, have another good look. Then he says, Allah Muhabba, as, Ya Allah Muhabba. That is what the Christian is saying, that God is love. We say, love is not his attribute. Allah gives us 99 attributes. He is Allah, Wallahu Allahi la ilaha illa hu. He is Allah, besides whom there is no other God, Al Malik the King, Al Quddus the Holy One, As Salam the source of peace and perfection, and on and on. 99 attributes. But Muhabba is not one of them. Now they get into your house, Allah Muhabba, Allah Muhabba. And the Umm Kulsum in Egypt, one of the greatest singers that the Arab world had produced, a woman, beautiful singer. I used to hear her sometimes, although I don't understand Arabic. Umm Kulsum. And she was singing on Cairo radio, Allah Muhabba, Allah Muhabba, and we think this is Islam. <laughs> Look, somebody brainwashed her and brainwashing the whole nation. Can you see? Master strokes of geniuses. These are the inroads. You know, they know how to catch fish. There is so much here. But I was given 45 minutes, and I think I have already exceeded 45 minutes. So I would rather leave this meeting, whatever few minutes we have or more, open to questions. And I prefer questions from the floor for a number of reasons. See, any coward can write anything. And we too can behave cowardly. What suits us, we answer. What suits us, we answer. No, I want to give you the opportunity to stand up. 
then everybody knows that this is your question. So when I'm answering, I'm looking at you and answering, watching you whether you are satisfied or not, whether you are nodding your head this way or that way, I can see what is happening to you. I am talking to you, the one who asked the question. Like this, the man from behind asked the question and I'm talking to the wall. And I don't know, this guy is saying, he's nodding his head. So, and it's also good for you. You see, you must learn, especially my children, you must learn to stand up and question. Stand up and speak out. Because then it will create that ability in you to stand up and speak. And this is a very, very profitable um, acquisition. Once you acquire that ability, one day, inshallah, you'll also reach the top. You see, you might be a genius, but who has heard you? It's only when you stand up and you open your mouth, people discuss, no, oh, man, we have a potential leader there. We have a potential leader there. In our debating service, look, man, you become the chairman or you become our secretary, anything. Stand up, open your mouth, ask. Don't be afraid to make a fool of yourself because that is the only way we learn. Go ahead and I think with the permission of the chairman, I leave the meeting open. If there are no questions at all, if you are too cowardly to stand up and ask, then you can write. But the first preference should be given to people who can stand up and ask your question. I will answer less waste of, wastage of time. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Silence, please. Yes, brother. Yes, the, I thank you for the benefit of those who might not have been able to hear. I will repeat your question. That uh, the Christians say that Jesus Christ is coming back. The Muslim also say he's coming back. We believe that our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, is Khatimun Nabiyin, is the last of the prophets. There shall be no prophets after him. But when Jesus Christ comes, he is a prophet. So how can he come when the Khatam al Nabin has already come? That is a problem. But there is it's no real problem. You see, if you take any worldly example, the Shah of Iran. You know the Shah of Iran? I think in 1953 he ran away. He had to flee. And America, through a certain machination, they put him back again. But suppose, suppose he was not reinstated. And another Shah was taking his place. And then this guy returns. He returns to the country. He said, look, amnesty is granted to him. What is he returning as? Shah? His title is a Shah. Muhammad Shah Pahlavi. Right? But is he returning as a Shah or as a subject of Khomeini? He's returning as a subject. A king abdicates. He's a king. King George V said, say he abdicates, or sixth. He abdicates. He still got the title. He was King George V, the sixth. And there is another king who said, the last king of Britain was so and so. Right? But this guy is still alive after 80 years, 90 years, he's still there. Or he comes back from another country. You say, well, King George, you know, will say add certain things. But he's still king. But he's not the king of the place. He's got the title. So the prophet is a prophet. But what does he come and do? A prophet's job is to give you new guidance, a new revelation, a new wahi. We Muslims, we don't need anything new. Allah tells us in the Quran, long before, just a little before our Prophet passed away, He said, He says, this day I have perfected for you your religion. 
وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي and have completed my favors unto you وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ and have willed that Islam should be your religion finish you don't need another prophet, a Masi or a Mahdi to come and tell you that instead of making three rakats for Maghrib you make four you don't have anybody to come and tell you that you fast now for 40 days instead of 30 you don't need anybody to come and teach you anything Everything that Allah wanted to give you, He's given it to you in al hiris Kalam and in the life example of the Prophet. So what is He going to come and do? See, the question still remains, what is He going to come and do? I said, look, the answer is in the Christian Bible. It's not our problem, it's a Christian's problem. I said, this is in your book, the Bible, the Holy Bible. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, there's a book called the Gospel of St. Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament. You see, this book, the Bible, is 66 books. This is an encyclopedia of 66 books, divided into Old Testament and New Testament. In the New Testament, there are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so on, 27 books. The first book is called Matthew, Gospel of St. Matthew. So in the Gospel of St. Matthew, we are told, supposed to be the words of Jesus, he says, many will say to me on that day of his second coming, or the last day, Yawm al Qiyamah, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, like God, God, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? Didn't we do so many things for you? You know, we went and looked after the lepers. You know, these backward nations of the earth, we brought them into your religion, we baptized them. You know, we built orphanages for them, we built hospitals for them, we educated them. Didn't we do all these things in your name? And we took out devils out of people in your name? So Jesus, in answer to that, he says, Then will I profess unto them, then I will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get away, you rubbish, I don't even know you. I said, That's why he's coming. To tell you that you are off the track. See, I said, who is doing all these things in the name of Jesus? Muslims? Do we cast out devils from people in the name of Jesus? Do we? Do we build orphanages in the name of Jesus? Or the Hindus? Or the Buddhists? Or the atheists? Who does it? The Christian. He is doing in the name of Jesus. So I said, he's going to tell you, not the Jews. He won't tell the Jew Jews, get away rubbish. He won't tell the Hindus, get away rubbish. He won't tell the Muslims, get away rubbish. He's going to tell you. You who say Jesus is Lord, God, Lord, God is right. He says, get away from me. I don't even know you because you are off the track. Instead of worshipping the one and only true God, you're worshipping Jesus. For that reason, he's coming back to put you to the right track. We don't need anybody. We don't need a Masih. We don't need a Mahdi. If the time comes, if they come, he says, welcome. But don't wait for anybody. Nobody's going to pull the chestnut out of the fire for you. You will have to do your own work. Then we have been sitting back. We are waiting. The Muslim world has been waiting. That's why brought to this condition. We are in the gutter because you're waiting for somebody to pull you out of the gutter. Nobody's going to pull you out of the gutter. This is not Allah's law. So Allah says, Inna Allah la yukhajiru ma bi qawmin hatta yukhajiru ma bi anfusihim. Say, Allah will not change the condition of a people unless you change yourself. He is not going to pick you up from the gutter and put you on the pedestal. You will have to work and sweat for it yourself. Yes, any other question? Yes, my son. Uh, come, come forward, come forward. Those who want to ask questions from, from the back, please come forward so we don't have to waste time. Anybody else in the meantime? Anybody else in the meantime? Come, come forward, come forward, come forward. Anybody else in the meantime? Oh, there's a mic here, I didn't know. Come, 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 come. All of you who want to ask questions, come forward here. There was a war going among slowly, the two slowly, Islamic slowly, nations. Slowly. There is a war going among the two Islamic nations between Iran and Iraq. So my point of question is, is God punishing them or is it a hell on earth? Uh, I think if I am told that the question is, that there is a war going on between Iran and Iraq, whether that is God punishing them or whether this is hell on earth. That is the question. Well, it is hell all right. If you are there, if you were in it, I tell you, it is hell. See? But this is man's own making. See, This is our own making. Hell, we are making hell for ourselves. 
You have made a little heaven for yourself here in this country. You see, there's another nation, same opportunity they get, they make hell out of it. Drink, you know, like Lamu, Lamu, Lamu here is an island. Lamu is an island just off Mombasa. That Lamu island was 100% Muslim, same like you. You say, Mali, 100% Muslim. Lamu, 100% Muslim. And that place was like a veritable Medina. Business time, when the Azan goes, I'm sorry, Azan goes, shh, all shops close. Everybody's queuing for the mosque. Maybe better than here. Everybody doesn't queue for the mosque. There, shh, the whole island goes into the masjids. Fantastic community. They were, it was a heaven on earth. You say, this is the last paradise on earth? It is. It's natural resources, beauty, unpolluted atmosphere, beautiful. That was also a heaven on earth. Peace. It was also a very peaceful community. Alhamdulillah. Good Muslims. As good as ourselves are better than us. Lamu. But across the waters is Africa. With its animist, pagans and Christians. And these Lamu Muslims were not interested in them. We are all right. We are 100%. Today, Lamu has more bars. You know bars for drinking? Yes, more bars and bottle stores and dance halls and brothels on Lamu today than any other comparative sized place in Kenya. So it was a hell on earth today. It was a heaven on earth. You allowed it. You didn't want to change the other people. They came and changed you now. So it is man who makes heaven or hell for himself, you see. Says like Iqbal, one of our philosopher poet, he says, Amal se zindagi banti hai jannat bhi jahannam bhi ye khaki apni fitrat mein na nuri hai na nari hai. You see, it is your deeds which make heaven or hell for you. You, by your very nature, you are not intended for hell or for heaven, but you are going to make it for yourself. So, man is making hell for himself on this earth, and he can also create a heaven. It's left to him. It's in his hands. Allah has given it to him. So, in which lot of translation of Holy Quran, up to date, I read and I, I have seen that uh, Eve was made by a rib of Adam alayhi salam, Adam alayhi salam, a piece of rib. So sometime back, about years back, I mean, when I was as a radio officer in a ship, on a ship, so I went to Bombay and I met a Brahman. He said that Shiva, Shiva's, uh, I mean, Lord Shiva's ribs was made Parvati, his wife. Parvati is his wife and Shiva is the Lord. And the Shiva was, I mean, Parvati was made by uh, Lord Shiva's rib. So then these two has similar meaning and relationship. That is why I would like to know whether there has been an error of this. Yes. You see, my son, this rib story is not in the Quran. This rib story, you know, about Allah making Adam alayhi salam and putting him to sleep and taking out his rib and putting flesh around it. This is in the Christian Bible. There is no such story in the Quran. So the Quran that you read, you see, you said you read it in the Quran, maybe some commentator, some foolish commentator, you know, he must have read the Bible and he introduces that idea into the, his commentary. In the Arabic Quran, there is no such thing. Allah says, he's made Adam and he's made Eve of like nature, he made them both. It doesn't speak about Allah taking out the rib. The rib story is in the Bible. So, this Brahman fellow, if you knew, next time you meet him, you tell him that this is in, in the Bible, and you ask the Christian that question. Who got from whom? <laughs> this may be a very simple and silly question, but I would like to ask you this question. There is... Yes. Um, be, uh, non-believers very often ask us this question. There is, everything must be created by someone, or somebody, or some part. So my question is, who created, and how was God created? Very logical, very logical question. See, it says we all say God created everything. So who created God? Uh, if it's just a f passing time, we say God. Who created God? It's a God. Who created him is a God? Who created him is a God? 
And who created him? He said, God. I said, look, wait, wait, wait. Have a little patience. We believe in life after death. We will all get up, resurrected, and we'll be confronted by our Lord. It's a fantastic opportunity for us then to ask him, hey, you, where you come from? <laughs> ask Allah. Say, hey, where you come from? Who made you? Ask him then. He, and you'll get the answer. Okay? <laughs> you'll get the answer. We'll ask him, tu kahan se aya? Where you come from? Mm -hmm. Where's your father? Ask him. <laughs> He'll tell you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Finish? No more? Any other question? Come, come, come. Please don't waste time. Come and line up here. Then we don't waste time. Anybody else? Otherwise, it's the last question, if there's no more. What about the girls? I know the girls, they ask questions that really make you think. In other countries, the ladies, when they ask questions, it makes you really think. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they really make you think. Of course, we don't love it. You see, a Greek philosopher, he said, a Greek philosopher, he said, if you want to make a man to hate you, make him think. Because we don't like to think. It's easier to dig an acre of land than to think. Many people therefore don't want to think. But I know my sisters and my daughters, they can make you think. But it's a benefit to us in the future because it increases our knowledge. By you asking questions, making us to think, you see, our knowledge increases, though we don't like it for the moment. Yes, my son. Sir, in your speech you said that uh, the Christians are trying to catch us. So, how are we Muslims going to be protected from this? Do we have any way of protecting ourselves from? from the Christians? They are trying to catch us. So, is there any way that we could be saved? Yes. Yeah. Oh, to be saved? What do you mean saved? So that we, we won't be caught in the... Oh, we won't be caught napping. Yes. You see, the only way is knowledge. When we have knowledge, there is safety in knowledge. Knowledge power, it gives you a shield of defense, it's a weapon of attack and defense. Knowledge. Knowledge is power. So without knowledge, we get caught out. So for the moment, you people are relatively safe. Relatively. <coughs> in other words, there is no direct onslaught. The Christ Christian missionaries, I don't know whether they know that you exist here. I don't know what it is. You see? Yes. Maybe the world doesn't know that you are here on the map of the world, you see, but you have been, you know, somehow protected by some unseen power. I said in New York, you have one million women who can't get husbands if every man got married. But of your manpower, one third are gays. They call them gays. <laughs> Am I attacking you? This is what you are telling me. I'm only repeating for, to you. I said, look, you have a problem. And the solution to your problem is in this book. It's not in there. That's all I'm telling you. Says you want a solution? We have it. Unfortunately, we Muslims are not good exemplars. But Allah has given it to us. You and I, we can take it up, and inshallah, we can become the torchbearers of light and learning, and a solution to the problems of mankind with this book. No man, how small you are, you and I, we can do the job, inshallah. I think we should close up. Excuse me, this will be the last question. Please make your question very brief and quick. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow at the same time at Iskandar School. Uh, Brother Didat will be speaking on uh, Muhammad, the natural successor to Jesus Christ. So please make your question brief. Thank you very much. My dear brother, my question is this. Now, if we touch a dog, we are to wash our hands seven times. Not once, but twice, thrice. We are to wash our hands seven times. My question is why? Is the dog is the most uh, dirtiest animal? What was the dog? Huh? So if you touch, touch the dog, you wash your hands seven times and? and why, why does he have to do it seven times? Look, you have no problem. <laughs> You have no dogs in the country, what are you worried about? <laughs> what are you worried about? Look, I think, you know, your, I don't know how it happened. You know, I want to go into your history. How it happened that your nation, the, all your archipelagos, or what you call them, all your kind of islands, 
You have no dogs. What happened? Did you eat them up? You know, the Chinese, they ate them up. The Chinese, there's no dogs in China too. Except, you know, people, they want to bring them from the outside and they put heavy taxes. So dissuading people from bringing dogs into the country in China. But as a people as a whole, they wipe them out, dogs. But they add them up. They add up the dogs. What did you people do? What happened to them? <laughs> because they can't become extinct by themselves, the dogs, you know? They are hardy, hardy breed. So, but you have no problem. Alhamdulillah, you have no problem about you touching the dog and having to wash yourself seven times. And maybe you have a scarcity of water too. No, you have no problem, my son. When the problem arises, you can ask your sheikh, your imam. Inshallah, he'll give you a satisfactory answer. So, Brother Didat, on behalf of all the brothers and sisters who are present here today, uh, I thank you very much for your excellent speech. Um, and this is just a reminder again that tomorrow at the same time we will have another lecture from Brother Didat, but this time it will be at Iskandar School and not at Armenia School. And the topic for tomorrow's discussion will be. Great.